Hello, my name is Shian Armagani. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgeons at the Florida Orthopedic Institute. Florida Orthopedic Institute has locations at 10 different areas within the Tampa Bay area. I myself uh, predominantly see patients out of our Citrus Park Clinic off of Gun Highway, as well as our telecom location off of Fletcher. Today I'll be talking to you about the diagnosis and the treatment of common cervical spine conditions. First, we'll talk a little bit about how this may affect you. Approximately 10.2 million visits are made annually to physicians' offices and hospitals, outpatient departments for neck pain. More than 80% of individuals experience neck pain during their lifetime, with 30 to 50% of the general adult population reporting neck pain annually. First, we'll talk a little bit about what the anatomy is like uh, in the cervical spine. This is a common um, uh, bone within the cervical spine. Just to orient you a little bit, this is as if you're laying down. Up here is where your uh, uh, mouth and the front of your uh, head would be. And this is the back of your neck. We call this area here the lamina, and this is the covering that protects your spinal cord, which sits in here. We also have um, the vertebral body, which is uh, right in the middle, and that kind of protects everything from the front. In between each vertebral body is the cushioning between the bones, which is the disc. Just to show you what things would commonly look like on an MRI, you can see the same anatomy here. This is a, a cervical spine MRI looking at you from the side, okay? So over here is where your mouth and the front of your uh, face would be. And this white strip is the skin of the back of your neck. Your brain is here and the spinal cord is the dark um, kind of line that goes all the way down, all the way down. The kind of grayish squares are the vertebral bodies, the bones that we were talking about on the previous slide. And the black between each vertebral body is the disc or the cushioning between uh, each of the bones. Now, over time, however, sometimes these discs can degenerate, which is just part of normal aging. But depending upon how the disc degenerates and how small the canal is that holds your spinal cord, sometimes you can get pressure on nerves which can cause neck pain and arm pain, which we'll get into later. Going over to this um, uh, image of the MRI, this is kind of like what we were looking at previously where you have yourself laying down. This is the lamina that we were talking about. This is the muscles of the back of your neck. And your spinal cord is the gray oval in the middle. The thing to pay close attention to is the space that goes out from the spinal cord here and here. These two spaces are widely open and those are the spaces where your nerves go out of your spinal cord and then down your arms. We'll see in a second what it would look like if there was potentially a problem. But most people when they have an issue, some people come in with just neck pain. Other people with a cervical spine condition come in with just arm pain. However, most people have uh, a combination of both, whether it's 50% and 50% neck pain to arm pain, or 90% arm pain and only 10% neck pain. So when you try to think about what are the conditions that can cause each of these, it's a good thing to break it down into what is giving the patient or yourself uh, the most discomfort and what could be those diagnoses. So for example, something that can cause both arm pain and neck pain is, for example, a disc herniation. Something called spondylosis, which is basically kind of aging of the bones within the cervical spine or in the lumbar spine. Um, but basically, it's what you're thinking about when you have bone spurs or arthritis. Just like you have arthritis in your knee and, and hips, you can have that develop within the cervical spine too, which can cause compression. And lastly, something else called myelopathy, which is its own kind of diagnosis and has to do when the spinal cord itself is compressed and causes different um, issues with balance or problems with dropping things or clumsiness. But then you have things that can cause only neck pain. 
These are things like degenerative disc disease that you may have heard of, uh, deformity, scoliosis, kyphosis. All of these words just basically mean different ways that the bones within your spine are aligned, and that can cause just neck pain. But then we have the kind of dreaded black box, and that's honestly the truth of what most only neck pain can be, and that is there are a lot of things that we just don't know why patients have neck pain, but kind of the job of the spine surgeon or anybody that's evaluating you for your neck or arm complaints has to make sure that there aren't one of these other things that are potentially treatable as a cause for your discomfort. Things that can cause just arm pain. You, know, you can have shoulder issues. You can have a peripheral neuropathy. That's basically a big word for carpal tunnel syndrome um, or other uh, areas where nerves within your body can become compressed outside of your spine. So one thing that we all try to do when we're evaluating these patients is go over a detailed history with the patient. And it's good as a patient too, to kind of know what we're thinking about a little bit as well, so that you're better able to let us know uh, what, is the, what is the thing that's bothering you uh, the most and how we can best try to get you back on track. So I typically like to have the patient trace out where their discomfort is located. And the reason I use the word discomfort as opposed to pain has to do with the fact that there are a lot of other different types of um, feelings that a patient can have when they have a pinched nerve. Uh, sometimes they can describe numbness and tingling. Sometimes they can describe a crampy feeling. Other times it's one of those um, electrical uh, pains or sharp stabbing pains. So sometimes you may ask someone, you know, show me where you hurt, but they may not point at it because they may not hurt there. They may just have a numbness and tingling that bothers them. So it's important to kind of describe that and that's why I ask about discomfort. Um, you also want to know about how long this has been going on and that's important to know because it determines whether something is a chronic issue, which is kind of greater than three months, or an acute issue, which is something that just kind of started within the last 12 weeks. You want to know if they're having any weakness within their muscles or any issues with balance or hand dexterity or, or clumsiness. So uh, just briefly, this, these are kind of the um, muscle groups that we look at to try to see what, um, uh, what particular nerve could be causing a patient's discomfort or weakness. And uh, believe it or not, any type of motion that you make with your arms is um, is controlled by a particular nerve within your spinal cord. And you can kind of test this um, on yourself or on your own patients uh, just by looking at any of these different, um, different graphs and uh, diagrams that kind of show us where patients' pain could be or discomfort and if that nerve compression is causing weakness in a specific muscle. So for example, if you want to take the C6 nerve, which is one of the most common nerves that's compressed, well, we would look at how your wrist extends backwards, and if you're unable to keep your wrist up when we're trying to push it down, that lets us know that there may be a problem with that C6 nerve. In addition, if a patient is pointing to discomfort that goes down their arm into their thumb and index finger, that's also a sign that the C6 nerve could be involved. And so these are things that we should, uh, we should be evaluating on all our patients that come in with neck or arm symptoms. So one thing that we need to talk about too is what we were talking about earlier with the uh, black box of um, things that can cause uh, neck pain. And that thing is just generally called nonspecific neck pain. And this is pain or discomfort in the neck and or shoulder uh, area with or without referred pain into the arms. And this is something that where a precise pathoanatomical cause cannot be established. So this is the patient that comes in with neck pain, pain possibly in their shoulder. However, the MRI of their neck is fine. They don't demonstrate any weakness. They don't really have any numbness or tingling that goes into their arms. You've evaluated their shoulder. 
um, and any area in that uh, region which could be causing pain and everything just kind of comes back normal. So for these patients, it's not that they don't have pain, it's just we cannot find an identifiable cause for their pain and an identifiable way that we can treat it with a surgery. So unfortunately, nonspecific neck pain is globally ranked number four as a cause for years lived with a disability. So this is something that can affect patients for a very long time, especially if it goes into that chronic state and they're not treated. Also, the course of neck pain, though, is favorable for most people. However, about a quarter of individuals who recover from an episode of neck pain will experience a subsequent episode of neck pain um, later in their life. That's why one of the things that we like to stress to our patients who come in with nonspecific neck pain that gets better with things like physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, those sorts of things, is that we encourage them to continue doing the exercises that they were taught at their physical therapy location, even when they're feeling good. That way, their neck muscles and their shoulder area remain strong, because if you wait to do therapy and you're already hurting, you're already a little bit behind the eight ball. So if you get over this, uh, non-specific neck pain episode, you continue your physical therapy even when you're feeling good, you have an excellent chance of not only decreasing the frequency that you have these episodes, but also when you have an episode, it decreases the duration that you're in discomfort. Additionally, for many patients, neck pain is also a complex uh, biopsychosocial disorder with problematic physical and psychological symptoms. And this is something that can definitely affect our patients as this becomes a chronic issue because you have someone that was doing very, very well. All of a sudden, they started getting some neck pain. The neck pain worsened over time, went on for three months, six months, 12 months. And now all of a sudden they can't do the things that they used to enjoy. So when you get to a point where you're not doing the things you're, you're enjoying, it can really bring down your overall mood and can actually exacerbate some of the pain and the symptoms that you're experiencing. There's a way to classify this, and I won't get too much into the, um, um, the nitty-gritty of it, but uh, the thing that we need to really look out for is uh, kind of column three here, and that is in patients who have nonspecific neck pain, they have no signs or symptoms of a major structural pathology, but they have the presence of neurological signs such as decreased tendon reflexes or weakness or sensory deficits. These are the people that if they come into your clinic and you can't find, or, and they're complaining of neck pain, but they have these other associated neurological signs, they should probably be evaluated further. So the treatment for this is really just patient reassurance. The vast majority of these will get better with time. You want to try to get them into some range of motion and strengthening exercises because what you don't want to start is have a patient who has a significant amount of pain in their neck, but because of the pain in their neck, they're starting to get afraid to move their neck around. And when that starts happening, stiffness kind of rolls in. And in any field in orthopedics, stiffness is not something you want for a non-fused joint. So when stiffness comes about, it leads to more pain. Pain leads to more stiffness, which leads to more pain. And you can see how this can snowball out of control um, over the course of six months to a year and can cause patients a significant amount of disability. I like to do multimodal care, and that's exercises with uh, manipulation or mobilization. Also, clinical massage works well. And the mainstay is uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, plus or minus muscle relaxers. Um, muscle relaxers uh, really uh, vary whether they do well for certain patients. Some patients, they do wonderful with muscle relaxers. Others, they don't feel anything. Others, it just makes them sleepy. But I think the key is, is if symptoms are present for greater than three months or and they persist for that long, 
it should warrant an MRI and a referral to a specialist just to check out if there isn't one of those identifiable causes that we were talking about for neck pain, which can um, be corrected with, uh, with an operation. Another diagnosis that's very common within, uh, within the population is called cervical radiculopathy. Radiculopathy is just a big word for shooting discomfort or pain, tingling down the arm. And this is associated with reduced space for the nerve root uh, or the, in the canal and or an inflammatory reaction within the nerve root. And this is most often triggered by a disc herniation or by uh, bone spurs. And so one thing that you can see here is if you remember our prior MRI where I was showing you uh, where the discs are and where the bones are, if you can see here, there is a little bit of a bulge within the disc space that's compressing upon the spinal cord and subsequently the nerves. Looking even further, you can see that there's a really big opening for the nerve outside of here, but when you look over on this side, it is almost non-existent because the disc, the disc herniation has gone into the area where the nerve um, is supposed to exit and go down the arm and is causing a significant amount of compression. So again, just to kind of reiterate, this is normal and this is abnormal. So the thing that we try to really look for is again, we look for the spinal cord, which is the gray uh, kind of oval here and you can kind of barely see the uh, spinal cord over on this side. You don't see that kind of characteristic white around the spinal cord, which is the spinal fluid, um, and you just cannot see that over on this side because it's been compressed so much. In addition, we were talking about the kind of alleyways, or I like to call them exits off of the highway for where the nerves are. So if you think of the uh, uh, spine right here as I-75, the exit or wherever the nerve takes off is uh, what we call the foramen or the hole where the nerve goes out. You can see here that there's no blockage. There's no, there's no problem for that nerve to kind of exit off of the main highway and go, down, and go down the arm. But if you look over here, boy, there's a big traffic jam there. There's a lot of congestion and a lot of um, blockage of that exit. So you can imagine if a nerve's trying to go out of that hole and there's a big blockade there, it's going to get pinched. And that nerve is the most sensitive part in your body and it can cause a significant amount of pain and discomfort. So the prevalence of cervical radiculopathy is found to be about 3.5 people per 1,000. But 45% of patients with cervical radiculopathy actually have great resolution of their symptoms within six weeks of onset. However, the remaining 55% can continue to have a minor to moderate degree of long-term morbidity or uh, issues stemming from this. And the reason why is your body actually has a great capacity to try to make those disc herniations go away. Just like your body is able to fight infection or bacteria or um, you get a cut on your arm and it's able to heal it up, your body can actually make these disc herniations kind of disappear. And that's why a lot of people end up getting a good amount of relief after about six weeks. And so that's why within that six week time period, we always try to symptomatically manage our patients to see if their body can handle getting rid of the disc herniation on their own so they'll hopefully never have to have an operation. So how do these patients present? Um, the symptoms are usually in a specific dermatomal distribution in the upper extremity. And again, a dermatome is uh, basically, we have certain areas within our body where we know where certain nerves give sensation and pain to. And they're a little bit different, but for the most part, uh, they're pretty consistent. And so that's one thing that we look at when we're talking to the patients. We say, where's your discomfort? And they point down their arm to their thumb and index finger. Well, that's probably gonna be C6. Um, patients describe any number of discomfort. They can describe sharp pain, tingling, burning sensation in the involved area. But there also may be a sensory or mortar loss corresponding to the nerve root involved, and the reflex activity may also be diminished depending on the duration of how long they've had the herniation. 
Uh, this could also be associated surprisingly with anterior chest pain, headaches, and uh, something that we call cervical angina. And this is left-sided chest pain and arm pain that's actually related to a compressed nerve within the cervical spine. But this is the patient that'll come in and say, I've gone to the ER uh, two or three times within the last few months with terrible uh, pain right in the middle of my chest and it goes down my arm and they have a negative workup for anything cardiac related. Their heart's fine, their lungs are fine. This is a patient that you may consider evaluating or sending over to a spine surgeon to see if maybe they have a nerve root that's compressing their spine and causing their discomfort. How do you manage these patients? Well, generally this is going to improve on their own. Like almost everything within the spine world, almost everything kind of gets better on its own. Um, in the absence of weakness or severe pain requiring multiple visits to the ER, the following should be used or can be used, and that's a short-term course of non-steroidals and or muscle relaxers and or steroid packs. The muscle relaxers and the steroid uh, can help some people, but they don't help everybody. Um, but short-term course of anti-inflammatories are known to help patients more than things like narcotic medication. Uh, physical therapy and chiropractic care should also be utilized within that six-week period. But if symptoms have been going on for greater than one month or they're persisting for greater than one, uh, one month, um, obtain an MRI of the cervical spine without contrast and probably refer to a specialist for more evaluation. And then what do we do in the uh, rare instance that a patient may need an operation to kind of get rid of the disc herniation or the bone spurs that's causing them so much discomfort? Well, we can treat these a number of ways. We can do what are called anterior approaches, which involve making small incisions in the crease line within the neck. And these involve uh, the gold standard, which is anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. Basically, this involves removing the entire disc that is causing the uh, compression of the nerve, replacing it with a spacer, and then sometimes putting a plate on the front to uh, make sure that the two bones in between where the disc was, they basically grow together and that's where the fusion comes in. However, in recent, um, in the last 10 years, um, a lot of research has been gone into cervical disc replacement. So it's the same procedure. You take the disc out that's causing the compression of the nerves within the spinal cord, but instead of putting in a spacer and a plate, you put in a special device that basically acts like a disc and keeps range of motion. Now this has become all of the rage, uh, especially with, um, uh, especially in younger patients. But what should be known though about cervical disc replacement is that there's a very narrow uh, indication for uh, patients who can get these. Not everybody would be a good candidate for a cervical disc replacement. That's why it's a good idea to visit or have a consultation with somebody who's trained in doing uh, both procedures. And that's something that all of our spine surgeons have at Florida Orthopedic Institute. In addition, uh, there are posterior approaches too. And posterior just means going through the back of the neck instead of the front. And this involves a procedure called a laminoforaminotomy. It's a big word. Basically what it means is we make a small hole uh, to gain access to the spinal cord. We gently move around a nerve root and possibly try to pull out the disc from the back if needed. Additionally, you can do a laminectomy and fusion, which means you just kind of remove the bone that covers the spinal cord on the back side and you stabilize that segment with screws and rods. Laminectomy infusion typically happens more in settings where patients have had previous surgery before, they've had previous fusions that have failed or have not uh, healed completely, or they're used for patients who have multi-level uh, disc herniations or uh, bone spurs that require um, many levels to be addressed. Cervical myelopathy. This is one of those weird ones that can cause very, very vague symptoms, and, um, but unfortunately is one of the more dangerous things that we deal with as spine surgeons. 
So cervical myelopathy is the most common cause of spinal cord impairment in adults and can manifest with a range of signs and symptoms. They can have gait instability, diminished hand dexterity, motor weakness, sensory loss, and functional decline. Um, a lot of times this can be the patient that comes in. Uh, generally, they're a little bit older. They may be uh, of retirement age or greater, but they can also be seen in patients in their 40s and 50s, depending on what their uh, anatomy looks like. But in general, this is a retirement age individual who used to be walking around with no uh, issue, but then slowly started having some problems walking, may have had a fall or two, started using a cane. Then that patient that started using a cane now has to use a walker because they're so unsteady. And then they're having falls with the walker that then they're in a wheelchair. This can happen over the course of even less than a year. So if a patient comes in like that, that's something that should definitely trigger uh, your, uh, your mind to maybe look within the cervical spine or for a neurologic cause of why they're declining so quickly. So myelopathy occurs when there is stenosis, when the stenosis impinges upon the spinal cord. So to go back to radiculopathy, radiculopathy is compression of a nerve. Now the nerve is outside of the spinal cord. When you have compression of just the spinal cord, that's where you can get myelopathy. Now the confusing thing happens because some patients have compression of both their spinal cord and their nerve but it's still kind of treated the same way. You just have to be able to identify the cause and be able to um, uh, see if you can get them treated appropriately. Now the severity is related to the amount of the mechanical compression of the, of the spinal cord on the various tracks. So again, if you look back at one of uh, example MRIs of a patient with severe myelopathy, you can see the spinal cord here, the gray, with white on either side. The white on either side, again, like we talked about, is the spinal fluid. Now, there's a ton of space up for the spinal cord up here. You see a lot of white on either side. But then you get into this area, and it's very, very compressed. However, down below, it opens back up again. So the way that I like to describe this is, again, using a highway analogy. Think of your spinal cord as I-75. You have traffic going uh, down um, to your arms and legs, and then you have traffic coming up from your arms and legs up into your brain. Now, up here and up here is probably eight lanes, and there's no trouble. However, when you get into the area where there's a lot of compression, you can basically think of how I-75 would be at rush hour when it's only one lane. There's a lot of slow movement. There's the signals are not getting up to your brain quick enough and the signals from your brain aren't going back down quick enough. That's why you get patients who have uh, fumbling problems or clumsiness. They're dropping things. In addition, they're also having issues with walking. That's because they're not able to tell their feet, or their feet aren't able to tell the brain where they are in space. So they have to shuffle a little bit. They walk with a wide base gait, almost like they're on a boat. So how do these patients present? Well, typically it's an insidious onset that patients may be unaware of these subtle clinical findings. They may just think, oh, I'm just dropping things. It's not a, it's not a big deal. Or, oh, I had a fall. It's just, uh, you know, I just stumbled over something. But these patients often do have difficulty with fine motor tasks. I like to ask patients, you know, are they able to easily uh, uh, button buttons to a shirt or uh, put, on, uh, put on jewelry, pick up coins off of the table, those sorts of fine motor tasks. Also, they can have difficulty with balance as well. They're, they're having trouble walking even on, uh, even on flat surfaces. They're unable to keep their, um, their, keep their balance without falling. Now, these are some of the patients that can have diffuse neck pain. It can be pretty severe, but they also can have non-dermatomal hand numbness. Again, this is a patient that comes in, they talk to you, they say, Doc, I'm dropping things. My balance isn't quite what it used to be. I have to use a walker to get around now. My neck's killing me and my hands are always numb. These are patients where your kind of uh, um, blinkers for cervical myelopathy should really come into play. So what's the natural history of cervical myelopathy? Well, 
aside from or different from other um, from other conditions, this is a stepwise progression as opposed to a slow, gradual decline. You'll see a patient, they're doing fine for three months, two years, and then all of a sudden they're using a walker. And before they were just walking just fine. So you can think of things as kind of going down as a stepwise, uh, as a stepwise decline instead of just kind of gradual straight down. The key though is we don't know the depth of the step, meaning some patients can decline rather quickly within a few months. Other patients may have a quick decline and then two, three years later, they still haven't seen that second dip. But between 20 to 60% of patients with mild myelopathy deteriorate neurologically over time in the absence of surgical intervention. So these are again patients that you want to keep a very close eye on, uh, bringing them back initially every few months if they're stable and they're not and they don't have other criteria that would require you to operate immediately. Um, but these patients on the majority do see some sort of decline over time without a surgical intervention. So how do you manage these patients? Well, patients with subtle balance issues or abnormal reflexes, they should get a prompt MRI to rule out uh, how much compression they could be going on within their spinal cord. But close follow-up with neurologic examination should occur in these very um, mild patients at least every three to six months. Educate the patients on the different signs and symptoms to look out for for worsening. Bring them back to the clinic. Have them walk in the hallway just to show you how they're, uh, how they're moving around. Um, therapy can be used for gait and balance, and it can be helpful in early disease. But on the whole, if a patient has already transitioned from walking, walking freely to utilizing a walker or possibly a wheelchair, a uh, physical therapy is unlikely to really appreciably help that patient. So that's when we come into surgical management. And ultimately, if myelopathy is progressive, surgery is the most effective treatment. The goal of surgery is to stop the progression of the myelopathy, okay? So it's very difficult to be able to tell these patients you're gonna get a full recovery because the main goal of it is let's take the pressure off the spinal cord and allow the patient's body to start trying to heal whatever has been damaged. However, roughly one to two thirds of patients may see some improvement. A lot of that is dependent upon number of patient specific factors. Are they diabetic? How bad was their myelopathy before surgery? How, uh, how old are they? Uh, all these different factors play into that. But the main goal of any surgery for myelopathy is to stop the progression of the, um, of the compression so that the body can try to heal up what's already been damaged. Other considerations to think about, and that's differentiating cervical spine versus shoulder pain. This may have to do with either positional pain, pain at night, or painless weakness can kind of differentiate uh, cervical spine issues versus just kind of shoulder pain. And then another uh, important thing to look at from a uh, diagnosis standpoint is differentiating a, a cervical spine reason for compression of a nerve or a peripheral nerve compression. And these mostly have to do with provocative signs that we do at the cubital and carpal tunnels. We look at location and timing of pain and also a test called an EMG, which basically tries to uh, put little electrodes on different areas of your arm or, or legs if needed uh, to look and see if there is a compression of a nerve outside of the spinal cord, which could be causing a patient's discomfort. So in conclusion, in the absence of weakness or severe debilitating pain, conservative measures can be attempted for at least four to six weeks before advanced imaging is needed. Always check for balance and ask about hand dexterity. You do not want to miss a patient who has underlying cervical myelopathy. I can't tell you how many patients come in and they say they're here for their low back. You have them walk around, they're stumbling around. You ask them, do you have any problems with hand dexterity? They say, yeah, doc, I'm dropping things all the time. You get a scan of their neck and they have severe, severe compression. So it's always something to look at if a patient is coming into your clinic. 
Also, if symptoms are severe and they fail conservative measures, uh, please don't hesitate to refer to uh, any, any specialist uh, with spine training. Thank you.